The Brat Show, inspiring every woman to be bold, relevant, addictive, and transformative. Welcome to The Brat Show. I'm your host, Kathy Barthel, also known as Bratty Kathy. Mark Hatchie is a maverick. Back in 1980, in the male-dominated industry of audiovisual, she launched Dualcom Canada Incorporated. And then she expanded across the country. Dualcom was named one of Canada's 50 best managed private companies. Marg was rated in the top 10 of the top 100 women business owners in Canada. Today, she empowers women entrepreneurs as the managing director of Grow Your Biz. Welcome to the show, Marg. It's great to see you here. Thank you. My pleasure, Kathy. Yeah. Now, I've talked to you a little bit about what a brat is. And one of those things, Mark, is the fact that brats do things on their own terms. You know, we know who we are, we know what our goals are, and we move toward them. So this is why I want to talk a lot today, even though you don't have your business anymore that you had for what, 32 years? That's right. My yeah. goodness. Even though you don't, I want to go back in time because it's such a rich source of information for brats, for would-be brats, for all of us women in business who can really learn from some of that. Mm -hmm. So the best way to do this, I'm thinking, is to start with a Casablanca question. Remember that movie, Casablanca? Yes, I do. <laughs> all right. So, Marg, of all the businesses, in all the industries, in all the world, you walked into audiovisual. Mm -hmm. That's in right. Yeah. In well, 1980, when that industry was so male dominated, right? When there were so few women entrepreneurs compared certainly to today, and when there weren't the support systems, the women's organizations to the degree that they are today. But you charged in there. Why? Why? Well, many reasons, actually. It, it's interesting you say that. I don't know if I charged in, but I certainly <laughs> took a, a leap of faith, if you will. Yeah. I was working for a large multinational corporation. And, you know, I was probably working 60 to 90 hours a week. And I was starting after a few years to feel very unappreciated. Mm -hmm. And I thought, if I'm going to work this hard, it's going to be for Marg. And why audiovisual? You know, really, it was the realm of communication. You know, from a little girl, I'd always been told to stop talking, <laughs> stop talking. I <laughs> apparently spoke a lot and was very inquisitive. And I thought, you know, there's a real need for improved communication in business. So that was one of the reasons that, you know, I went into that area. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. In terms of communication, then, you know, they used to call me chatty Kathy. Now, yeah. what the heck is with that? Eh? <laughs> but I've been told that, you know, change agents, people who want to make a difference, we often have a lot to say as little kids. We have, you know, something we want to put out there even then, and we don't always know what it is, what we're going to end up doing. And of course, it can change. But right. as brats, you know, as long as we're aligned with who we are, it's still coming mm -hmm. from the same place. Why exactly. didn't you... Why didn't you perhaps decide to be an actress or a writer, a journalist? Mm -hmm. You know, <clears throat> I felt that the communication area was a skill I had. And even though it was in any area of technology, it was, as you mentioned earlier, male dominated. And, and I did. I worked in a sea of suits. And so it was very, very unusual in the beginning because I came from a field that was mainly women dominated. It was the, the cosmetic industry. And so it was all women for the most part. And so when I started my business, I was like the new kid on the block. So I really had to do things differently, Kathy. You know, I was competing with the big boys. I was new. I needed to differentiate myself. So I actually started doing workshops and seminars, teaching people how to use the products I was selling. And that was so that unusual. Was Sorry. Yeah, so it was my big differentiator. And maybe the fact that way back when I was younger, I wanted to teach. I, I think, you know, we see teachers as a role model growing up. Yeah. And so 
I thought, here's a way for me to develop those skills, teaching people. But it was really a great way to sell the products because when people are comfortable with something and when you educate people, you build a rapport as well. Mm -hmm. So it, it worked really well for me. You know, it was a differentiator. I was building a relationship with my clients because let's face it, Kathy, people buy from people they like. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And, and, and all these guys, did they, I guess they took to quite well to kind of being back in school. <laughs> you know, I mean, you're, <laughs> you're already different in that environment by being a woman, a woman. So it's interesting to yeah. me, right? So yeah. how, how did they take to that? I guess, obviously, okay. You know, it was interesting. I think because I came as the point as an instructor, a trainer, you know, they were used to women in that field even though I was competing with them in other areas, it was very interesting. In fact, the first seminar I did was for a conference at Niagara on the Lake for 20 men. And I thought, and we were charging an awful lot an hour. And at the time, you know, that's one of the things I think women typically undervalue their services. Yes. And I was charging them a lot at that time per hour. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, I better be good. <laughs> <laughs> I better be good. And I was, I got great reviews. And, um, and I think that's really important. Like, I, I think one of the, the things that's done me really well in my business and, and in my life too, is my mindset. Mm. Absolutely. You know, really embracing challenges um, and, yeah. and being a problem solver. Yeah. You know, we all face a lot of obstacles. You know, I could have, you know, said, oh, I can't go and do that. It's all male. They're all executives. You know, you go in there feeling inferior. Yeah. But I always encourage women, when you walk into a building, walk in like you own the building. Exactly. And, and it reminds me of the other piece of this from, you know, it's still true today, but certainly back then, when so many of the deals were done on the golf course, right? That's where the mentoring happened. That's where you found out all the dirt. It's like, you know, the mail room yes. is the other place in a building, right? Yeah. But on the golf course. And from what I understand, what you were saying was that you didn't necessarily golf or you didn't really have time to golf. No, so, no. so tell us what you did, which I loved, which is, which is what a brat does. It's like, you know, mm -hmm. I've got the situation. So I have yeah. a result I want. So I'm not really too keen on going this path. What else can I do with what's in front of me? Exactly. So and, and that's key, you know, overcoming obstacles. Yeah. So I, I knew a lot of business was done at the golf club. You know, it wasn't necessarily, I mean, a lot of it on the greens, but a lot of the 19th hole. So I'm, I'm pretty competitive. So I knew I didn't have time to be good at golf because it's a lot of practice. It's four to five hours to do 18 holes. And so, you know, that's a lot of time out of a week if you want to do it two or three times. So my, I couldn't afford that time initially in my business. So I took um, a membership, a social membership out at a golf club. So it allowed me to go to all the larger events when all the members were going for all the fancy dinners. And so it enabled me to interact and network with those executives being a social member, which was a lot cheaper to <laughs> getting yes. an annual membership. So, you know, there's always a way around an obstacle or a challenge and just doing things a little differently again. Exactly. I always say that, you know, my background includes television as well as journalism. And I always say that is one of the best trainings for being an entrepreneur because we're always thinking, okay, the show has to go on, the lights are set, everybody's on set. Okay, somebody didn't show up, you know, what's the workaround? We still have to make this thing happen. Oh, yes, yes. Right? Which we do as entrepreneurs. Yeah, that's right. We used to, as the business grew, uh, we started staging live events. Mm -hmm. So I know that world too, Kathy. And, and let's face it, it's a pretty stressful environment. <laughs> um, exciting when things go really well. Yeah. But, you know, when you do that sort of thing, we have to build in a lot of redundancy. Yes. You know, we're doing a presentation for the CEO of Microsoft. You put up $200,000 projectors, you know, with the image converged. Yes. So if one fails, the audience would never know. Exactly. So it's, you know, those are the types of things that it takes a lot more effort. Yeah to do things well, but that's how you build your credibility as an organization. Absolutely. And it's putting the work in at the front end, right? 
you know, this is a lesson I learned years ago when I taught myself how to sew. You put all those pieces together, whatever they are, and then you can deal with the hiccups as they come, if they come later, but right. you put the work in at the front end, which is, I think, mm -hmm. the key. Exactly. Now, you talked about being competitive. Where does that come from? Um, you know, I'm not sure. You know, I grew up in a family. I had one younger sister. There was just the two of us. But we were raised in a family um, where we were told we could do whatever we wanted to do and that our parents would support us. And, and I think that's it. And having a younger sister, maybe that's where the competition comes in. I'm not sure. Sibling rivalry. Yeah. Um, but we're very good friends and close today. But yeah. You know, there were times when I remember, especially in your teen years, you know, where you're a younger sister. Oh, my gosh. It's such a, a, a headache. At many, many times. But she wants to hang on and follow you yes, everywhere. Yes. But ironically, we started our first business together. I started it with my younger sister. And that was when I was 10. So she would have only been about six. And um, we start, we had tropical fish, you know, guppies, and they breed like crazy. I thought, what are we going to do with all these fish? And it turned out Woolworths, which was the department store in those days, yeah. sold guppies. So we ended up selling them to Woolworths and they turned for a nickel each, I think it was, which we thought was a fortune at the time. Yes. And, uh, and Woolworths turned around and sold them for 19 cents. And we, at the time, we hadn't figured out how to eliminate the middleman. Yeah. But, you know, these are things you learn. But it was a great learning experience. Oh, that's wonderful. For both of us, you know. So it was rather interesting. Yeah. You know, ironically, even though she was younger, she wanted to manage the money. Hmm. And even though she was studying nuclear physics at the U of T, she ended up getting a summer job as a bank teller and went into banking. She was in banking for 35 years. And um, so it's really interesting how things that happen in your youth, yeah. you know, help develop you into adulthood. Well, this is the thing. And this is when I coach people around, you know, brand presence and so on, and even about being on video. Right. It's the, the seeds of all of those strengths are always in childhood. Absolutely. And, you know, sometimes we drop those threads, right? And we think, I got to do this for all these reasons outside of me. Someone else told me or, you know, the trend is this. So I've got to do a 360. But when we stay aligned, right, yes. those are the strengths. Exactly. exactly. And another thing that you've said is that you were a rebel and, you know, as a kid, <laughs> And that you gave your parents some grief. Now, those of us who know you professionally <laughs> really want to know. <laughs> Give us an example, Mark. What was yeah, it? Well, you, you know, sometimes I went places that they didn't know I was going, <laughs> which is not unusual probably for most teenagers. Yeah. But, you know, um, I learned how to ride a motorcycle mm -hmm. and did that for many years. And then a lot of people have met me. I, I really just hung up my helmet a few years ago. Yeah. But a lot of people, you know, see me in the business environment dressed in a suit. Mm -hmm. And then I would comment that I ride that you see their chins drop, you know, that it's all about what you're wearing, right? You know, you Absolutely. Wear the clothes for the event. Absolutely. And so, uh, so that was a great way for my, actually my husband bought me my last motorcycle for a birthday present. Um, you know, he had a bike and I always liked to be in control. So I didn't like to be on the back of him where he's leaning and then I wanted to do my own thing. So he finally bought me my own bike and brought it home on a trailer mm -hmm. and like, you know, all the neighbors were out in the street, like, look what he got her now. So, <laughs> um, but it was those sorts of things that, you know, I, I didn't like, no, I, I never like to be told what to do. And maybe that's why I started my own business because I wanted to be in control. I wanted to make the decisions. Um, and I soon realized that as you grow a business, you don't get to make all the decisions. <laughs> <laughs> and you uh, don't fact, want to, right? It's exhausting oh, playing no, all those exactly. roles. Exactly. And in yeah. fact, one of the critical things to my success was building a good team. Yeah. I had a very diverse team um, and I really hired the intellectual property that I didn't possess. Yeah. You know, often we'd go somewhere and if, if the AV equipment broke down, mm -hmm. everyone would kind of turn around and look at me like I should fix it. And, um, I, you know, I, I would say, mm -mm, you know, I take a technician with me when I'm going somewhere. <laughs> yes. you know, so it's, uh, I wasn't that technical, but mm -hmm. I understood what those products could do for us in a business environment. Yeah. 
And that's what's important, really seeing the value of what you offer your clients that you can stop their pain points. Right. Just to circle back, how young were you when you started riding the motorcycle? Um, about 15. So that created yes. some palpitations for mom and dad. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Once they found out, yes. So anyway, but, you know, I, I did go back to the Toronto Motorcycle School and take lessons mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, it is something you have to be very careful. Yeah. You know, no, all kidding aside. Yes. But I didn't yes. ride a lot in the city. It was more getting out of the city and, and you know, breathing some fresh air and, you uh, making sure you have the screen on the front so you don't have bugs in your teeth. Exactly. <laughs> I hope you're enjoying the episode. If you are, go ahead and click like. And while you're there, click the subscribe button as well so you don't miss another episode. There are the ups and downs. There's all the different phases yeah. of a business. And when I think about the time when, you know, you were deciding to sell your business, uh, well, when you first, you know, closed it up and, and, and mm -hmm. sold it, and then when you bought it back and that that was a struggle, and mm -hmm. you said how you lost some of your self-confidence. I want to dig a little bit into that. Okay. Yeah. What happened and how did it actually affect you? And how did you get that confidence back? You know, I think it was, you know, as you grow a business, once you get over 50 million in revenue, you become a target. Mm. And I started getting a lot of offers. And, and at that time, of course, now my my two kids are in the business, you know, they've grown up and they're in the business. I hired my husband to, to run the facilities. He was a wow. facilities manager for a large yeah. Canadian organization. And I decided to hire him to join us. So the whole family is involved in the business. And I kept getting offers and, you know, everyone has a number yeah. and they finally hit the number. So I decided to sell. I mean, it was a family decision because they yeah. were very involved at this point in time. And so it was a family decision to sell, which initially was good because we all, like we stayed on, they wanted me to stay on mm -hmm. as a regional manager. Uh, it was an American based company publicly traded on NASDAQ. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, it only took them a little over three years to bankrupt the whole thing. $1.2 billion publicly traded company. And, and you know, people, have, you hear this story now and again, it's not unusual apparently. Yeah. They're great at mergers and acquisitions, yeah. but when it came time to start running, you know, all because they merged with a few companies, yeah. um, all these entrepreneurial organizations, that's where they failed. Mm. And ironically, so I arrived at work one day and, and you kind of have to picture this. It's a beautiful June day. And I just bought myself a Jaguar. Okay. <laughs> beautiful car. I was raised in Britain. My uncle was a race car driver and he, he raced Jags. And I used to go with him at the age of nine, mm. not that my parents were happy about that either to an <laughs> abandoned airport where he would practice. So anyway, but I always love cars. And so just got this. So it's beautiful June day. I'm driving to work and, you know, all is happy in the world. Yeah. And um, I pull into the parking lot and everyone, all the staff are in the parking lot. Like what's going on? Yeah. And Ernst and Young had locked the doors. The American company had filed chapter 11. Oh my God. So, you know, that's a day I look back on as a very pivotal point in my life, Kathy. First of all, um, I lost a lot personally because I had shares in that new company. Yeah. Yeah. And um, everyone is looking to you as the leader. This is when you've got to put your big girl panties on and stand up because everyone's saying, Marg, what do we do? What do we do? Yeah. Relax. Um, let me take care of this. Let me find out what's going on. You know, I think that's one of the things I learned is don't panic. Especially when you're doing live events. It's one of the skills I learned. Don't panic. And even if you're panicking inside, don't show it outside. The audience has no idea, right? Exactly. Unless you make them see that there's a problem, there isn't. Yeah, exactly. exactly. So, you know, I sent everyone home short story. You know, I'll make a short story of it. But, you know, we found the solution. Yeah got things up and running. I mean, it was more valuable. I, I had $7 million worth of projects on the go in just Toronto. So, you know, it was more valuable to keep it running than it was to lock the doors. Yeah. So we kept uh, running and, uh, and I managed to buy the business back. It was a struggle to get mm -hmm. financing or not. And I got it from everywhere I could. Yeah. So that, you know, when you start a business like that again, you're really in a hole to start with. Yeah. It's very challenging. It's one thing when you borrow money initially to start a business, yeah. 
but when you're you're borrowing to get out of a hole and then start building it's equally difficult and so i did i did buy the business back and you know never underestimate your network it was through my network that they introduced me to a vp at a bank that helped me get the money to start again amazing yeah. tell me though about um let's talk a little bit about how that felt about that self-confidence piece because you know there are so many times especially when women are starting businesses on their own and right. and now in a pandemic you know mm -hmm. where it's very easy to feel isolated to let yourself go inward instead of as you mm -hmm. say to expand and to ask for help right. right tell me about some of the dips at that time emotionally what what was that like how did you pull yourself out yeah, aside from was, the practical things it was really like running on a tightrope you know, through that time, yeah. um, you weren't quite sure what was going to happen. I think the thing that bothered me the most was um, how it affected my whole family. Yeah. My, my two sons were married, they had children, you know, we were all, they were older at this point in time. Yeah. And it had a big impact on them because they lost money too. Yeah. Um, also, I think what it did for me, it undermined my confidence in my ability to judge people. Like when I met these people from the US, I felt very comfortable with them. They were great fun. Uh, we took trips together. I mean, we did a conference. We took 2000 salespeople to Cincinnati. I mean, I've seen parts of Cincinnati I never want to see again. One of my staff got arrested for being drunk and disorderly. And I had to go to court in Cincinnati of all places. Anyway, uh, we digress. But it made me question my judgment of people. And that was really detrimental to me moving forward because, you know, I'd always been able to sort of, you know, when I interviewed people to join our team, I, I had a good feel about what was going and I started to question my ability. And, and that was very challenging for me. Um, I did start to question my, my business acumen, you know, and I knew I could grow a business, but it's much easier when you've got cash flow. You know, I always say happiness is positive cash flow. So, yes. <laughs> you know, it, um, it makes a big difference. Now, the CEO and CFO actually went to jail, went to prison uh, of that American company wow. for, for fraud. So, you know, going through all of that was very difficult, needless to say. But you know what? I'm resilient, Kathy. I'm a survivor and I'm a problem solver. And that's key for any entrepreneur. Regardless of the problem, you need to find a solution. And, you know, in some cases, you know, and I look back, I probably would have been smarter to let the thing go to bankruptcy. But <laughs> uh, again from square one. Yeah. So but I felt a responsibility to those families that, you know, I was responsible for. Yeah. And I imagine when you talk about losing the confidence in your ability to, to read people and to even to run a business, um, I would imagine, as you say, you know, the idea of sort of putting on that problem solving hat would help. Now you're dealing with something that in part is very emotional, you know, I mean, there's a mm -hmm. lot of emotion in business yes, for sure. and it's something we have to deal with, but mm -hmm. The fact that you combined, I'm, I'm going to solve a problem, it's, it, you know, kind of separating out, yes, emotionally, I feel this and this, but there's a problem. Combining that with going outward, as we said a moment ago, and, and getting help and getting feedback, I imagine. Do you think those were the couple of things that, that helped mm -hmm. you not sort of stay sunk yeah. in, in that emotional? Absolutely. And also, I had an incredible support network. Uh, you know, I purposely built my own advisory board right. and, you know, that's why I do what I do today. And those women were there for me. You know, they said, Marg, you built the business once, you'll do it again. You know, they were the voices in the back of my head yeah. that encouraged me. And, and that's so important to have those people, whoever they are, in your corner. Yeah. You know, someone I can pick up the phone and say, God, I'm having such a hard day. This supplier doesn't want to deliver to me unless they came cash up front, yeah. you know, because he's concerned about what, ha you know, how, yeah. how would they deal with that? Well, you got to give them cash up front, Mark. So, you know, we got to figure it out. And, I but I had those people to call. Yeah. And I think, you know, it's like uh, a, a, a lifeline in some cases. Mm -hmm. It's a support network that really helped me. And these were all women in different businesses. 
nothing like mine, yeah. but business is business. You know, they understood, yeah. okay, cash flow is a mess. Like, okay, you know, here's what I did yeah. when I had an issue. Yeah. Um, here's who you can talk to, you know, this sort of thing. Yeah. And it was really, I think that's what, one of the main things that kept me going, Kathy, mm -hmm. you know, I, mm -hmm. I'm sure there were days where, you know, I was, but I've always been the type of person to, to gr I think the thing is grit. You know, that's probably the best word I can describe it. Just get up and do it, you know, like. I love it. I love it. Yeah. This resilience piece of it yeah, is so. It is. And, and that's what you have to do. I mean, you know, sure. I could curl up at home in a fetal position and stay in bed. What good is that going to do? At the end of the day, I've got, when I bought the business back, we had, I had 130 employees left out of 180. And I said, okay, I've got 130 families that are depending on me. So get up, fix the hair, put the face on and out you go into the world to make this better. And it took me, uh, I'd say about nine years to build the business back up and get it ready to sell again. Wow. And, uh, you know, and, yeah. and it was difficult in the beginning, yeah. but as you know, I, we had a lot of loyal clients, mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot to be said about building a relationship with your clients, because yeah. when that happened, I actually got in my car and I drove to the key projects, the, the responsible person that we yeah. were dealing with. Yeah. And I said, look, here's what's happened. So right now I cannot finish your project. I understand if you can't wait till I get things straightened out, but if you have to go to a competitor to get it done, fine. But I don't want to lose you as a customer. I've really enjoyed working with you. And I was honest with them. Like I didn't yeah. lie if I didn't enjoy working with them. <laughs> but I said, you know, we, I've really enjoyed working with you and I, we were excited about this project. And I don't want to lose you as a customer. So I understand if you can't wait on this particular project, but I'd like to stay in touch. Yeah. You know, I didn't lose one client. This is wonderful. And this reminds me of something, you know, in the chat we had before doing this show, uh, when I was telling you what all the letters of the BRAT acronym stand for. And I got to the letter A and said that that was about being addictive in the sense that we leave our clients, our customers wanting more, wanting more right. of the relationship with us, of our integrity, of how we mm -hmm. do business, of how we are always there for them, whatever that is, that quality. And it seems to me this is talking to that and you you call it, I think it's so, what when we attract, we, we don't have yeah. to, what is it? Pursue, pursue I yeah. think in my note. Yeah, yeah. seems yeah, exactly. like a similar. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And you know, it's interesting when I started the business, I've always been a very curious person. Mm -hmm. So whenever I meet someone for the first time, um, you know, I know it's part of relationship building and selling, but I was really actually interested in the people I met. Like they were, everyone has a story, as you yeah. know, Kathy. And uh, I remember once going to KPMG mm -hmm. and the woman I was going to meet was in purchasing and, um, I was, ha I had a hard time parking and I got there. So, wow, the parking is terrible. I said, do you drive to work? She says, no, I take the go train. I said, oh, where do you come from? And it turned out she lived on the street behind me. <gasps> and our backyards almost touched each other. So, you know, that it, it's interesting when you get to know the people you're dealing with in business as individuals. Exactly. It's amazing the relationship you build. Even 30 years later, when I wasn't on the road anymore, salespeople would come back to me and say, Marg, so-and-so at ABC company asked about you. Is Marg still there? You know, like <laughs> yes. they remembered me. Well, ex ex exactly. And I think about, this is the thing about being a brat is it's being true to self. My high school uh, motto was true to self. And I still have that school ring. Yes. And honestly, it's, it's that value, right? You know who you are, you're owning that. And then everything you create from that is not only aligned, but it resonates with the people that you are best suited to serve. Not right. only, right? And, and these, these are the kinds of lifelong, oftentimes, relationships that, that grow out of that. Mm -hmm. um, I'm also, of course, mindful of your time. And I, I have one more question I want to ask okay. you. <laughs> <laughs> you told me a great story about, well, just to back it up, being resilient, 
as, as I'm sure anyone has seen in this, in this chat we've had, has a lot to do with having a sense of humor about all the stuff that happens in work. So you may know where I'm going with this. Tell us about the bubble truck, Mark. Oh, <laughs> yes, yeah, so you have to have a sense of humor in business, no doubt. Um, we had two divisions, you know, a division that built and designed boardrooms. And then we had the division that did staging, staging of live events and not rock concerts, but corporate events. And we were doing an event at the distillery district in Toronto. And anyone who knows that region knows it's very difficult to go in there with an 18 wheeler. Like it's just impossible. So the guys on the uh, staging that we're going to do an event at distillery it was actually for harley davidson interestingly enough and they came to me and they said marg we can't take the 10 they didn't want to take the 10 ton they wanted to take a bubble van so it's the one they're fiberglass and they're shaped like a bubble i don't know what they're really called but i've always called it a bubble van yeah. so i said okay i said but it's brand new belongs to the other department please be careful okay so off they go and you know, they call me after the show. They say, Mark, we just want to let you know the show went really well. Everybody's pleased. Good. And then I don't hear from them for a while. And then uh, I hear someone yelling in the back warehouse. And I thought, what is going on? That's unusual, you know, for people, mm -hmm. guys to be yelling. Yeah. And um, so finally, someone comes up to my office door and this, this sheepish knock at the door. And the two guys that were running that show come in and said, Mark, uh, we have a little problem. And they pass me a business card and it's the manager of the Dairy Queen. And I'm looking at it and they said, um, you will get a call from this gentleman. I, said, I will. And they said, yes, we stopped at Dairy Queen on the way back from the show. And uh, we made the mistake of not parking and going in. We went through the drive through and took the roof off the Dairy Queen. <laughs> so it was the Dairy Queen's manager's card that would be calling me. I thought, oh my gosh. And the trouble with those vans is you can't just repair them. It's fiberglass. It's got to be all replaced, you know? So, oh so as I say, you have to keep a sense of humor. Like I was really annoyed at the time, but when I look back on it, I think, oh my God, why? who would drive through, you know? It's, anyway, that's what happened. The roof went off the van. So, <laughs> so but, yeah. e exactly, right? This is, and, and they make the best stories. You know, oh, if we could only sure. think in the moment, this is going to be amazing. I'll open a talk with this. I'll create a <laughs> right. program around this. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, the trouble is our vans were all, you know, wrapped and covered. So everybody knew who we were, you know, so... <laughs> Of course. It's a good thing that wasn't the days of social media, right? Can yeah. you imagine? <laughs> yes. Well, we certainly would maybe have got more followers. <laughs> yes, you would have. You would have. And you would have bonded with all kinds of people through that crazy mishap. Yeah, right? they get it. You know, they get it. But anyway, yeah. those that was one of the funny incidents. There's always something going on. It's never dull in any business. No. Nope. And, um, and especially any that you hire people to work with. Yeah. Exactly. But that's oh. the only way to grow. Exactly. You can't do it alone. You can't do it alone. No. And this is the thing. This is the thing about that I always talk to people about with regarding with regard to being a brat. It's, you know, you know who you are and you know what you're going to do, but it's not about being insular. It's not about being this way. It's about being this way. Exactly. Right. And connecting. Yes. And, and that's how we make a difference in the world. Mm -hmm. right? Exactly. It's the yeah. only way. Exactly. Well, thank you, Marg. This has been fantastic. I really appreciate it. <laughs> My <laughs> pleasure, Kathy. And your stories. Uh, now, of course, if we catch you up, as we alluded to, and you alluded to a moment ago, to today, you know, since having your business for 32 years and so on, you've kept involved with women. You are a tremendous mentor and supporter of women through Grow Your Biz and also, of course, through your own company, which is called Evergreen Business Group. Mm -hmm. Tell us how people can get in touch with you. Okay. Well, I'm easy to reach at Grow Your Biz, and that's grow without a W. So G-R-O-Y-O-U-R-B-I-Z, and um, .com is the website. And then it's mhashi at growyourbiz.com. And hashi is H-A-C-H-E-Y. -E -Y. Yes, that's right. And um, I'm doing that now because I'm, you know, people, I thought when I sold the business the second time, I would retire and spend time with my grandchildren. 
but I soon discovered they don't have time for me. They're very busy in their lives. And, uh, and we have some entrepreneurs, uh, budding entrepreneurs coming yeah. up too, which is very exciting. Yeah. And um, you know, it's not too often that grandchildren call their grandmothers for technical advice <laughs> in their businesses. So it's kind of fun, mm. but I'm not ready to stay home and crochet. Yeah. And I have skills um, that I'd like to share with other business women to help them be successful. Yeah. Because I do know how to grow a business. And I think we all need to share our, our skills. Yeah. Um, I say there's a book in me, but I don't know when I'm going to have time to write it. I maybe have to record it and let somebody else write it. But exactly. um, that, that's something for the future as well. Thank you so much, Mark. That's wonderful. And I'm sure there'll be a lot of people reaching out to you as though you don't already have a full plate. <laughs> but thank you so much. And uh, hopefully we'll see you again soon when uh, the pandemic is behind us. Thank you, Kathy. My pleasure. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the interview, click like and subscribe and share this interview with any brat that you know. And don't forget to ring the bell. That way you'll get notified whenever we put out new content. See you soon. <laughs>